Let me ask this question. When is it okay to tell a lie? When is it okay to tell a lie? And it's good for us to define, okay, what is a lie? So we're going to spend a large portion of this morning unpacking falsehood and lies and how we shouldn't be doing those things and just kind of unpacking what Scripture says around that. And then we're going to jump back to our text in Mark and just kind of unpack how the enemy loves to um, distort and twist truth so that it confuses us and leads us down paths and basically entitles us to say what we want, do what we want, whenever we feel like it. So it's, uh, like I said, sorry, not sorry. Um, It's a tough one. But Google defines a lie as a false statement made with deliberate intent to deceive or or an intentional untruth. So what we see a lot of times with lies and falsehood, it has a lot to do with the intent behind it. So am I trying to be deceitful? Am I trying to hurt you? Am I trying to um, slander your name or whatever it is? So when we go back to that question, is it, when is it okay to tell a lie? When is it okay to tell a falsehood? Right? And, and, and it's an easy, we know the, the, the church answers never, but what about if your family's in jeopardy? What about if your wife asked about her new dress? Like, so we start to really justify, okay, well, maybe under certain circumstances where my well-being is at risk, is it okay to lie? Is it okay to keep quiet or the sin of omission or whatever it is? So there's lots of questions to get us thinking. Have you ever told a lie? Right? Put up your hand if you've ever told a lie. This is interactive. Put up your hands if you're lying. Um, right? And, and yes, the question, because we'll see how our minds work. Was it really that bad? Like if you think of a lie or something you've said or an omission or when you get stu- stopped by that officer, sorry, officer, I didn't know I was going so fast. Really. <laughs> um, so your, your, your foot's just heavy. Um, and, and right, we, we think at least, well, it's getting me out of trouble. It's not that bad, right? It's weird when we sin, it's not that bad, right? But when someone sins against us, anyone ever had anyone lie to you, speak falsehood over you? Why is it so much worse on the lips of someone else than on your own lips? Again, the human condition is to blame everyone else, everything else, and never look at our own hearts and our own intent of self-preservation um, that we manipulate and, and move. Right? And, and, and it always seems so much worse when someone else is doing it. So Jesus is arrested here and he's standing trial. Um, and upon Jesus' arrest, they first take him to Annas and then an illegal night court. So what's going on now that we'll unpack in the book of Mark, they take him to the Sanhedrin at night. It's completely illegal. It shouldn't happen. And then from there, they take him to a day court, which is legal, the Sanhedrin. And then I think from there, it's to um, Pilate and then to Herod and then to Pilate again, up and down. But they're essentially looking, is Jesus guilty? Can we find anything against him to, so that we can kill him, we can persecute? him. We can do what we want against Jesus. So again, there's this conflict of our desire for how we want Jesus to be an act versus who Jesus really is. And, and spoiler alert, they never find anything guilty or Je- they never find any evidence that Jesus is guilty of saying anything he wasn't. Amen. So you don't need to read the whole Bible, but it's there. Jesus was innocent. That's why Hebrews tells us that he who knew no sin took sin upon himself, that we could be set free, that we could walk in freedom. So everything we deserve is what Jesus endures in Mark 14, 15, that we see that we deserve to be beaten and spat on and and betrayed and all of these things. And the only person ever to not deserve anything is the one that bears our shame and our sin and our punishment. And we'll look at it. We can't understand the depths and the heart of God's love. But when we read Scripture and we see what Christ endured, we can see what He has rescued and redeemed us from. Pain and suffering and torture and loss. And that should elicit within us some sort of um, gratitude and, and praise and thanksgiving that God is good, that God is great. And when Jesus remains silent, it is for our good, not for our pain. So, and, and so another question again, who believes lies then or false witness is wrong, right? We all, can we agree that lying in any degree is wrong? But it, again, it depends because most of you will disagree on this even, or maybe it's okay when it comes to the new dress or getting out of a traffic fine because who's really hurt? And, and the issue isn't the fact that we're telling lies, the issue is that we're manipulating truth. And that's the problem in the church today. That's the problem in all of our lives, in our marriages, in our businesses, is that we manipulate truth. We don't necessarily call it a lie. But anything that is not practiced as truth, anything that is not walked in as truth, is feeding the father of lies, which is Satan. 
So, so we, this morning, we're either going to be team Jesus, which is team truth, and work out our salvation with fear and trembling, or we're going to be team Satan and just lead our li- lives by lies and manipulation and untruths that j- just flow off our tongue without even thinking about it. Because it's funny how our lips of someone else is always worse. Sins of other people is always worse. Sins of omission in our own lives kind of come, in, uh, come as easy as they, they do, or we dilute truth, right? Anyone say, oh, sorry I'm late, it was my wife's fault. But actually you weren't even out of bed yet, right? Or, or whatever it is, sorry we're late, we, we, we got stuck in traffic, right? The three cars in front of you. It's funny how your mind makes three cars traffic. Um, and my point of all of these things is for us to look and go, okay, my intent of my heart is to grow deception. My intent of my heart is to get away and, and limit as much conflict as possible. And the only way we think we can do that is by sowing deception and lies and mistruths and falsehoods. Where Christ says the only way you're truly going to be free is to walk in the light, to walk in the truth that is Jesus. Because when we walk in the truth, there can be no shame. When we bring things in the, to the light and Satan wants to condemn us or convict us, we can say, it's okay, Jesus already knows. But where we hide in the darkness, where we deceive and, and, and let lies and stuff grow, grow, grow feral, is where we build shame and isolation. And, and, and yeah, so, so, yeah, sorry, not sorry. <laughs> and, and, and when we want to advance ourselves and persevere ourselves or push our own agenda, it's crazy how quickly we can compromise, right? And, and I speak about it all the time. I, we don't speak about money, but I say the one area in your life where you are most challenged is in your tithe and your most challenged in your ethics is around your finances, right? And, and again, it points to this truth where we want to manipulate, we want to call the shots, we want to guide and direct according to how we want rather than how Scripture commands and guides and directs, because Scripture leads to freedom, and our deception leads to, to entrapment, time and time again. And, and, and while we, we, you know, we, we cannot control how other people hear the things we do, it's even in that I'll say something and it'll be misunderstood, and I'll blame everyone for listening wrong, not for speaking wrong. We are responsible for our tone and the words in which we speak, time and time again. And, and I've said it, the issue is not the lie. The issue is not how close, the, the issue is how close to the line can I get before it becomes a sin. Right? We know it. When, you, when you're a teenager and you get saved, it's, it is how, uh, or how, how, how much can I kiss my girlfriend before it's a problem? How much can I drink before it's a problem, right? How much, how close to the line before it actually becomes sin? Right? Surely a white line is kind of teetering while I'm, I'm, I'm encouraging, I'm uplifting people, then how can be a, be a sin? So instead of staying far away from the line of deception and, and corruption, we kind of like to just play with it a little because there's an excitement in it. I spoke about it at Jericho's Wednesday Bible studies in the evening, how good sin is, right? Sin is a rad, right? Wrong thing to say at church. You, you all should have said, no, pastor, we need a new pastor. <laughs> but name me one sin that before you commit it is not pleasurable. Name me one act where while you're doing it, you don't think, oh, this is great, this is going to fulfill my longing, my emptiness, my, my desire, which can only be found in Christ. That's what sin is. It's a deception that you can satisfy your own needs, that you can be content apart from Christ. Ecclesiastes says it's chasing the wind. We're continually chasing, and, and, and if we're not careful, we build lies and deception that make us believe what we own, what we own next, what we have around us, who we have around us. That is where identity is found. But Scripture shows us it is in Christ and Christ alone. And, and, and it's so easy for this deception to play out in our lives. Because the issue is the avoidance of truth. Right? Truth will set you free. Not lies, not deception. Truth will set you free. As hard as it is, as, as difficult as it is to work out your salvation with fear and trembling, you're working out the truth of God in your life. And, and, and by His grace, we get through. We're not saved by telling the truth. We're saved by Him who is the truth, Jesus. And we allow Jesus to work and minister through our lives. And the issue, again, truth reveals our hearts, our thoughts, and ultimately our actions. So, so we, we like to, to stay away from truth, if we're honest. Because it's just easier sometimes. To, it's easier to lie than to actually be vulnerable and deal with things. It's easier just to get, not get a ticket to lie and manipulate whatever it is. And, and yes, the, the, the wonderful truth is we can justify any action just because you can justify doesn't make it true. Right? We can justify pretty much anything you've ever done, you can justify. Let's be honest. But does that make it true and does that make it not a sin? Because the problem is once something can be justified, 
Once we can justify an action or a thought or a words that we speak, we no longer need, we no longer think we need to repent. And where there's a failure of repentance in our lives, there's a disconnect with the Father. Because repentance, we still can be saved, but unless there's repentance, unless there's a restoration and a changing of behavior and attitude, how can we be restored to the Father? How can we enjoy the, the streams of living water and the Holy Spirit evident, guiding and directing our lives where we have pockets of deceit and sin, which we fail to acknowledge as sin and repent of, if we're following? That's the, the, it's such a fine line of truth and deception or truth and deception and how easy it is to sow deception and discord between us and our Father and us with, with everyone else around us. And one of the issues is we think that we have to convey truth with a hammer. We, and, but Jesus shows us it's done perfectly in peace and in gentleness and truth. We don't have to bash everyone with the truth. We can learn from Scripture how to be gentle, how to nurture our words, how to speak in love with the Holy Spirit flowing through us. Proverbs 15 verse 1 says, A gentle answer deflects anger, but harsh words makes tempers flare up. And and again, the whole of Scripture that speaks about our words, our false witness, all of these things is about speaking in a way to uplift and grow the kingdom and others would know the love and the worth of Christ um, and to keep the peace. Truth in relationships, especially between Christians, is it's commanded in Scripture. Ephesians 4.25, there's lots of Scripture this morning. Ephesians 4.25, therefore put away falsehood. In other words, the whole, we've been looking at Mark the whole time for the last year. Run from deceit, run from lives. Do not fill your lives with lies or deceit that makes you question the truth or, or sends us down rabbit holes that does not build us up. Therefore put away falsehood. Um, let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor, for we are members one of another. And, and the truth is Jesus, not gossip, right? Some of you take Ephesians 4.25 and say, oh, we have to speak the truth to my neighbor. I'm going to tell him just what that person said at church. I'm going to tell them what, what Mary's up to next door. That's not what it says. It says speak the truth. Speak the life-giving truth, which is Jesus. And I thought of Genesis 12. This is where it gets murky in our lives. Going back to my first question, when is it okay to lie? Genesis 12, Abraham and Sarah are going for a walk, um, and Abraham sees, I think it's Pharaoh, whoever it is, and he's like, well, Pharaoh's going to beat me. I'm going to get beaten if he finds out my wife's so good looking. I'm going to say she's my sister. So Pharaoh then takes Sarah into the temple, and eventually it all comes out that Abraham's actually the husband, and God brings um, punishment against Pharaoh, which is weird in that state. We're not going to unpack Genesis 12 now. Uh, But ultimately, um, Abraham sins and lies for self-preservation, right? Would we lie to protect, uh, protect our family? More than likely. I spoke to someone yesterday, the day before, and they were like, well, I lied in this, in this instance of, of um, danger to protect my family, and they don't believe it's a sin. And I'm, uh, we're not getting into, is it a sin or not a sin? We're not, but, but it gets murky in troubled times. We know that, but we need to make sure that we are laying the foundation in our lives for truth and, and, and mercy and grace. Because essentially, right, um, you know, Abraham only wanted to protect himself. That a, a, a lie or deception or falsehood doesn't trust that God is sufficient. Abraham did not trust God would keep him and protect him in the land that he had bought him. That's essentially it. He took it into his own hands to tell God how he will or won't act in his life. So he thought the only way to achieve what God is going to do in my life or the protection of God is to lie. There was a mistrust. There was a a lack of faith in the hand of God in his life. And and, and we need to be careful of that because, again, we can justify. I mean, no no one here is not going to be Abraham, right? We're going to lie. We're going to cheat. We're going to do whatever we can not to get a beating from the Pharaoh, if we're honest. But that doesn't make it right. It makes it sinful. And there was punishment. And Abraham had to come in repentance. Right? And, and, and that's why the intent behind our words is very important. And, and, the grace, and by the grace of God, we are saved not by our words, but by Jesus' words. That it is finished on the cross. Right? Where, where grace can, can abound. We, we are saved by grace and grace alone. But we rob ourselves from walking in that grace when we fill our lives with deceit and lies and falsehood. Time and time again, that's why Galatians 5.13 says, Do not use your physical freedom. In other words, that you can act and speak how you want to rob you of your spiritual freedom. It's a beautiful piece of scripture that tells us how I conduct myself, how I speak on a daily basis directly impacts my spiritual connection to the Father. We know that, right? You want to go home, fight with your wife, say something dumb to your wife, and tell me how good the the relationship is. 
And and, and it's the exact same with God. We cannot treat God's church and His people like fools or or, um, use them as punching bags and then expect our relationship to the Father to be right and thriving and thriving and, and awesome. And, and, and the command in Scripture is not to lie or speak falsehoods um, for, for the sake of the, the growth of the kingdom. Lies break relationship. It's that simple. Psalms 15 verse 1 to Psalms 15. How do we enter the sanctuary of the Lord? So if there's a disconnect this morning, if you're saying, well, I was, yeah, church was cool. Why did we sing so long? Why is pastor preaching so long? I want to go home. If there's a disconnect to the presence of God, the moving of the Spirit, the goodness of God, perhaps it's something like this. Uh, um, Psalms 15 says, Who may worship in, the, in your sanctuary, Lord? Who may enter your presence on the holy hill? Those who lead blameless lives. Not perfect lives, but those that are walking repentance. That's a better understanding because no, who's perfect? Excellent. Um, you came to the right place. But, but a blameless life is someone that we can't blame you for something because it's already been nailed to the cross with Christ. So it means that although I mess up, I need to be quick to repent. I need to be quick to to not sulk. I need to be quick to apologize and get restoration. That's a blameless life. Not a perfect life, but a blameless life is a repentant life. Um, So lead a plan and do what is right. Speaking the truth from sincere hearts, those who refuse to gossip or harm their neighbors or speak evil of their friends. So when we let gossip run rough, when we speak how we want, when we um, speak ill or whatever it is, we're going to struggle to come into the house of the Lord to worship with open hearts. There's going to be a hindrance. There's going to be anger and frustration. And, and the Bible uses the, the, shows us a lot of times there's going to be boulders in our way. Sometimes you come to church, you feel like there's a boulder in your heart. You feel like no matter what you do, you cannot just, you can see it. You can, you, it's over there, yes, Lord, but there's a boulder that hinders you. And it's unrepentant. It's gossip. It's slander. It's falsehood that we fill our lives with. And again, we justify it so we never repent of it. Some of you are still sitting under the burden of shame and sin from past lies that you have never repented of today. It's not a salvation issue, it's a flow issue. It's a Holy Spirit issue. And and Jesus traces lying back to Satan. Satan, the father of lies, lies, John 8, 44. And and, and that's it. Uh, We are uh, aligning lies directly from the pit of hell in in any form or fashion. um, and, And we just need to take it seriously this morning. Packer says, he says, God requires us to take seriously not only his words, but ours as well. So that was a way longer introduction, so don't worry, the rest is a bit quicker. Mark 14, 53, so they took Jesus to the high priest's home where the leading priests, the elders, and the teachers of religious law had gathered. Meanwhile, Peter followed him at a distance and went right into the high priest's courtyard. There they sat with the guards, warming themselves by the fire. We don't have time to get into that this morning, but there's a lot there. But inside, the leading priest and the entire high council were trying to find evidence against Jesus so they could put him to death, but they couldn't find any. Many false witnesses spoke against him, but they contradicted each other. Finally, some men stood up and gave false testimony. We heard him say, I will destroy the... And we heard him say, right, where have we heard that before? In the garden, Genesis 2. Satan said, did God really say? Right, they're saying diet and manipulation. We're going to come back to that. But, but it says, we heard him say, did God really say, I will destroy the temple made with human hands, and in three days I will build another made without human hands. But even then, they didn't get their story straight. And, and false witness and lies cause chaos and dissension. That's what we see, right? And, and, and so where, where there's chaos and dissension in our lives, it is always good to say, is there a falsehood that I'm operating under? Maybe you, you have, um, you, you, you're fighting with extended family or children or parents, whatever it is. Am I operating under a falsehood that, that Satan has deceived, that, that I'm hated, I'm not wanted, uh, and whatever it is, right, that I will never be loved? That's a falsehood that Satan plants in our lives that affects and causes dissension. So, so what are we operating under? The truth of the gospel to redeem and restore or lies and deception. It's so good just to ask, is there a falsehood that I'm operating under? And if we are lacking peace, it could be a number of different things in our lives. But is this dissension and lies and bitterness and, and gossip with our words? And we've already spoken about the importance of our words and, and, um, and, and the intent behind it. And, and, and Satan is the father of lies. And what I want to point out in this piece of scripture is that the tactics used in, this, in the text are the same tactics, tactics that Satan uses in our lives. So, so Satan attacks in various, many different ways, but what we see in the text, they take a truth and they manipulate it, and, and, and it makes it believable. 
right? It's a manipulation of the word of God to sow dissension, to sow doubt. We lie, um, we, we like to hide from the truth. Um, we lie to hide from the truth. We lie because the, the tr- we don't believe the truth is sufficient. All of these things. That's what we see when Satan tempted Eve, Adam and Eve, Jesus in the wilderness and us in our day to culture. Can the word of God be trusted? Right? Satan quotes scripture to, um, to deceive or to try to deceive Jesus in the wilderness. Our culture today, if you th- look at the, the biggest attacks within the church and surrounding the church, isn't from um, secularization. It's from the shifting of the gospel and the, the, the core belief system of the scripture, which is taking truth and manipulating it and twisting it to that which sounds good. That's what scripture warns us of time and time again. And, and here's the thing, right? They accuse Jesus of saying something that he really did say. That's what, if, if you know your scripture, John 2 verse 19, Jesus says, all right, Jesus replied, destroy this temple in three days, I will rise it up. But Jesus didn't say he would destroy the temple, he said he was the temple. So they took truth and manipulated it and changed its intent and meaning to cause the destruction and ultimately the death of Jesus. And, and, and we see the same pattern that Satan uses. He takes truth, he takes scripture, he takes grace, and he cheapens it and he dilutes it so that it would serve self rather than honor God. And, and, and it was a serious accusation against Jesus because any, um, any threat against the temple or, or temple was seen as a, a capital offense. It would have been like treason. So, so they're trying to get this treason charge against Jesus because then they would have had a right to put him to death. But we see even in that, it was not sufficient. Even in that, he was innocent. And, 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 and that's why the, this is the most twisted form of untruth because an untruth, when there's a, an untruth that has an element of truth, it becomes very difficult to combat. But isn't that your experience with those that are, have shifted from a core biblical belief that there's a shifting of gospel that becomes so difficult to relate to or discuss with because there's elements of truth? So where do we agree? Where do we disagree? Where is the line? Where is this working? And how does this work out in our lives? Someone said, it says, a lie that is a lie may be met and fought outright, but a lie that is partly the truth is a, a, a harder matter to fight. We know that in our lives. When your child blatantly lies to you, it's easy to deal with. When they lie in a manipulated truth, all of a sudden, well, we're, like, how do we handle this? How do we deal with these things? And we see that time and time again. And it's why it's so important to come back to the truth of the gospel, to allow the truth of the gospel to play out in our lives. We are to be people of truth. The Westminster um, larger catechisms or whatever it is, when they explained Exodus 20 verse 16, which is, thou shall not bear false witness, um, it says, it supposes, it sounds way complicated, but it supposes the principle that a negative implies a positive. A negative implies a positive. Essentially what they do in this fancy whole big book, they expand and say, for the ninth commandment, or the, do not bear false witness, to play out in our lives, it's not about not bearing false witness, it's about telling the truth. So for us to walk in obedience to the, the, the command that says, do not bear false witness, it's not about not being false witness, it's about being speakers of truth. So how do we combat falsehood? How do we combat lies of the enemy to show dissension and disbelief and all of these things? By speaking the truth, by knowing the truth, by trusting the truth and allowing the truth to fold or guide and direct our path on a daily basis if we follow it. And, and, and as believers, we, we are to use our words to season and build up, not to destroy uh, or, or, uh, or to be destructive. Right, it's hard these days to walk into any conversation, um, especially because it's political now. I'm not preaching political, but any conversation, right? It's just every political platform is about how bad everyone else is to break down, to destroy. And we naturally, you'll notice how much more negative currently is South Africa because of the elections than uplifting and encouraging. But generally, South Africa is a is an uplifting country. We've got good sports. That was my list. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I love South Africa through and through. So, um, but we have so much. But, but it's this subtlety of the enemy to use mistruths and lies. And I'm not saying we don't speak ab- about injustice or corruption. We do those things. But there's a way in which we conduct ourselves which breeds life or breeds death. There's a way we speak about our children, our marriages, our churches, and, and what God is doing that breeds life and excitement and one that breeds death. Right, you're going to be very hard pressed to find any political party that isn't campaigning on the destruction of the other parties rather than on doing the job right. 
right? And, and aren't we like that in church, in our lives, right? The only way to make you feel better about your marriage is to put someone else's marriage down. The only way to make you feel better about what you drive is to put someone else, there's always someone with a worse car, right? It's weird how we work, but we sow deception and lies and falsehoods against our neighbors that we do not know just to make ourselves feel better rather than returning to Christ and finding out who we are in Him. That's what the enemy is doing, taking these truths or slight truths and manipulating them that we do not know and we allow, we open the door for him to come in and destroy. Verse 60 says, Then the high priest stood up before the others and asked Jesus, Well, aren't you going to answer these charges? Why do you have to, what do you have to say for yourself? But Jesus was silent and made no reply. Then the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the son of Jesus, uh, the son of the blessed one? At this stage, the high priest is getting furious because they, they've been there all night or however long it was, and they just can't get an answer to prove that Jesus is guilty, that he, that he is worthy of being beat. Jesus remained silent. Jesus could have called on a, a, a legion of angels, right? They were all sitting on heaven just watching, ready to, to pound down or pounce down and destroy. He could have called on all those that he had healed and witnessed, all of those around. could have even called the demons because the demons knew who he was. Right? There was no lack of people who knew who Jesus was. But there was a deceptive element in the, in the Sanhedrin at the moment that was leading them to not see. Their eyes were blind. Right? And, 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 and it was Jesus' silence that kept him in that moment. And sometimes this morning, when Jesus seems silent in your life, he has not forsaken you or forgotten you. He is priming for something great. He is, he is still with you, He's still before you, but He is at work. His silence doesn't mean His inactivity. His silence does not mean He lost. Again, right, I warned us well, last week or the week before of the dangers of taking a snapshot of Scripture. If we take a snapshot of Scripture, Jesus looks like He lost. There's hopelessness, there's despair. In the silence of Christ over our lives, we sometimes think it's over and it's lost. But it is not. Christ is still at work. He remained silent to endure. And then he finally breaks the silence. And he says, Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated in the place of power at God's right hand and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothing to show this, his horror and said, Why do we need other witnesses? You have all heard his blasphemy. What is your verdict? Guilty, they cried. He deserves to die. And like I've said already, when Jesus seems to have lost here, he was actually winning. There's a beautiful uh, uh, um, 1 Corinthians 2, 7 to 9. 1 Corinthians 2, 7 to 9 is beautiful, and I think it parallels in Hebrews as well. It says, No, the wisdom we speak of is the mystery of God, His plan that was previously hidden, even though He made it for our ultimate glory before the world began, but the rulers of the world have not understood it. The Sanhedrin, the ruler, everyone else have not understood. If they had, they would not have crucified a glorious Lord. I think Hebrews says if Satan knew the plans, he wouldn't have done it because he knew he was lost. So in your life where you think you've lost, where you think Jesus is silent, where you think Jesus, it's, it's over, Jesus is just getting ready. That, that is what Scripture means when they, when they say, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love Him. And again, I've said it in my opening statement, I said it, we don't know the depth and the heart and the wonder of God's love over our lives where we can see from this piece of scripture what he endured, the beating he endured, the ridicule he endured, the humiliation he endured, the separation he endured, the sin that he endured, that we would not have to do that. He endured so that we would know the love of God, that we could spend our lives and eternity in the depth uh, and growing and understanding the depth and the wonder that is God's love. Because of what he endured in verse 65, it should, should break our hearts that then some of them began to spit at him and they blindfolded him and beat him with their fist. Prophesied to us, they, jeered, they cheered and God slapped him as they took him away. And then what love is this that the, the son of man would endure pain and humiliation for you and me? What love is this that, that the son of man kept quiet in his darkest hours? He did not cry out when he could have brought relief and redemption in that moment for himself, but he endured what we should have rightfully endured, that we would be called sons and daughters. What love is this, that the Son of Man withheld his fist as the sweat dripped off his brow, as the blood ran off his face, he withheld himself in meekness for our sake as we sit, as, as we sit here. What love is this, that he's endured so much so for, for you and me. 
and it just blows my mind as, we, as we, we, we've started about lies and deception and how guilty we truly all are. No one sits here uh, that, that is innocent. No one sits here that has not lied, that has not manipulated, that has not um, sowed deceit in our lives, and yet Christ, in full view of all of this for eternity, saw us and, and knew our name and went to the cross for you and I. Amen. Endured the pain and the suffering for you and I. So as the, the band comes up the, this morning, we, we're just going to play one last song and, and just, just take a moment to ponder that wonderful truth. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son. And when it says He gave His only begotten Son, it wasn't just the emptying of equality, something not to hold on to, but in the very form of a servant all the way to the cross. He endured pain and suffering and humiliation and separation that we would never have to know that in relationship to the Father. So I'm just going to close in prayer, and um, the band's going to play. If anyone wants prayer for anything, please come forward. Yeah, um, there will be people up front that can pray for you. So let's pray. Yes, Lord, we just come before you this morning, Lord, and we are just awestruck by the power of grace. We do not need to be defined by lies that we have uttered or lies that have been uttered against us. We do not need to be um, living in, in, in you know, the, the, the mistruth and the falsehood of others against us. We can hear those words that we are your children, that you know us, that you love us, that you're for us, not against us, Lord. Had you endured so much pain and suffering that we would not have to, Lord. You endured unease and unrest that we would have peace. So, Lord, this morning we start with repentance, Lord, where there has been sin in our lives, where there has been unforgiveness or bitterness or lies that we have sown or lies that we have accepted, that from the pit of hell, Lord, we repent of those things this morning. We are children of God. We are loved. We are worthy because Christ has bore our place to make us worthy. That we are not perfect, but we can lead blameless lives because we lead repented lives. So, Lord, we know we have messed up this morning, Lord. We know that we speak with ill tone. We speak with ill intent, Lord. We know that we, your word says, put a guard before our mouths, Lord. So, Lord, we pray, it's a bro- Lord, where there's unforgiveness, where there's lies, where there's deception, where we are living in those lies, those untruths of our worth, of our value, that through the work of the Holy Spirit right now, Lord, you would start to, to just do a work in that, Lord where there has been words spoken over us from our parents or teachers or, or past loved ones, whatever it is, Lord, and we have allowed those things to, to fester and take root. Lord, we pray the Holy Spirit would tear up right now, Lord. Lord, lies have led to the destruction of our lives. Deception has led to, to a, a breaking of heart and soul and mind in our lives, Lord. So Lord, we pray like a, just like a, a, a big scoopy, Lord, that you would just come take away all the nonsense, Lord. Where the blood of Jesus falls, where the body of Christ is broken, Lord, there can be no room for lies. Deception will not have its place in our lives, Lord. We want to be a church of truth. We want to be a church that walks in your word, Lord. We want to be a church that wrestles with your word and say, yes, Lord, we want to work out how this affects how we speak, how we act, how we interact with people. But ultimately, we want you to be our God. To the left or to the right, the Holy Spirit would guide, Lord. And Lord, we want to do it with gentleness. It says your love leads to repentance, not hammer throwing, Lord. So this morning we just come, Lord, we are so aware of our own faults. Lord, we want to build upon the holy ground which is Christ we want to walk upon the holy ground which is Christ so Lord guide and direct us today we pray Lord as we have the, sing the last song Lord do a work in us Lord we don't want to we don't want to put off tomorrow what you're challenging us on today Lord we repent Lord meet us Lord you are sufficient let your streams of living water flow this morning Lord Lord, we pray this morning for some, they will know the lightness that is Christ. They will know the freedom that is Christ to walk in truth, to accept the truth of Christ, that we are loved, that we are sufficient. So Lord, we just pray that now in your wonderful name. Thank you, Jesus.
Thank you, Jesus. Amen.